Today is always the most fun day. Just being here is happiness. Weekdays, off days, holidays, every day. Changing seasons and unchanging every day. The treasure we call every day, I give to you today as well. The world is waiting to be found. In front of your eyes is a full-scale map of the world. And today, the days go on. The miracle called normality. Yotsuba taught me love again. I hate children. I hate the anime trend of loud children, typically girls, being loud children. The frequency of which a series has included a character so obnoxious that it forced me to stop watching is the near sole reason I retain little interest for anime as a whole. Excited to check out a story of a rock band forming that supposedly has phenomenal music? Actually, it's a patience test featuring aggravating, annoying, infuriating, and grating. Ready to get into one of the legendary pillars of the medium? I'd rather just buy the shirt and pretend I watched it. So overjoyed because you're finally getting to the series you've known in your heart is the most perfect, flawless... <laughs> Children and adults in the real world are loud and obnoxious enough as is, and I tend to engage with media to get away from the real world. Similarly, slice of life tends to be a hard sell. When a story's premise is, here's a bunch of characters doing everyday things, that's great, but I'm a character doing everyday things. If I wanted to experience the whims of routine activities, I'd go outside. Am I supposed to deeply sympathize with a character when I see them doing laundry, thinking to myself, oh man, I know exactly the horrendous atrocities they're being forced to endure right now. As a result, I gravitate towards stories rooted in a different reality from my own that may embody technological dreams of a distant future, an artistically gorgeous crayon sketch of animal adventure, or worlds where anything and everything happen. Even if a series is set on an unaltered, feasible, very real Earth, I can still find escapist enjoyment through experiencing circumstances I would never find myself in. So my interest in Yotsuba strikes me as somewhat bizarre. Yotsuba to or Yotsuba Ampersand, chronicles the simple day-to-day -day life of loud girl Yotsuba Koiwai in a very real Japan doing very normal activities. I will be referring to both the series as a whole and the character herself simply as Yotsuba for the remainder of this video. Play along and see if you can guess which one I'm referring to whenever I mention it. So let's get deeper into Yotsuba. <laughs> As mentioned, Yotsuba focuses on Yotsuba, whose green hair and quadruple pigtails can be attributed to Yotsuba, Japanese for four-leaf clover. I nearly had the series ruined for me upon learning that 4chan based their design off of her. <laughs> Regardless, this five-minute energy of a five-year-old only stops exuberantly having fun when she physically cannot stay awake. Even then, just mention food or an exciting new place and she will be instantly revitalized. You can typically tell which speech bubbles are hers even if you don't understand understand Japanese. Yotsuba's dialogue is always written purely in the simpler hiragana instead of utilizing kanji, which is used to further signify her innocence and childishness. I love it! Occasionally, she'll end a sentence with wa, which is a style of speech reminiscent of daughters of high-class families or princesses. I'd die for her. Neither of these are unique to Yotsuba, but I'd be remiss to not mention them. Over the course of the at this exact moment 15 currently published volumes, Yotsuba undergoes much minor change. Her too tall, rougher appearance early on gets smoothed out, as does her personality. Yotsuba's speech in the first few volumes is somewhat slangy, and she can be coarsely blunt to those around her. She's lovable in a knuckle-headed juvenile way, yet becomes more of a precious kiddo as her random, unexpected remarks become less unintentionally rude. She goes from someone who would absolutely listen to Machine Girl to someone who would absolutely listen to Koto. 20 years is still a long time for a per perpetually five-year-old character to develop. Just look at how yellowed my copy of the first volume is. That first volume opens up the story with Yotsuba moving into a new home with her adoptive dad.
dad, Yosuke. Yotsuba thinks Yosuke is really cool, usually, and Yosuke makes efforts to seem like the cool dad to Yotsuba. He's almost too laid back, though can become just as animated as his partner in crime. Yosuke is used to Yotsuba's antics and generally has to clean up after her mistakes, but always has room in his heart for Yotsuba, regardless of how much mischief she creates. Yosuke's friend, Jumbo, who I think has a real name, is essentially another Yosuke, except that he's the tallest guy in the world. Jumbo drops by a occasionally and is always willing to encourage Yotsuba's lively spirit. Yotsuba and Yosuke are neighbors to the Ayase family of three sisters. As Yotsuba describes, there's the long-haired pretty one, the not pretty one, and the one who teaches her about global warming. They have names too, and there's plenty of other characters Yotsuba crosses paths with, though they all remain outside the scope of importance for this video. As a series, Yotsuba is handled exceptionally well, in my opinion. Yotsuba's actions never create any trouble, nor do any greater conflicts arise. Early on, it seems the idea of Yotsuba being adopted might lead to deeper plot moments, yet this is mentioned exactly twice. Chapters often relate to one another, though I think keeping the focus entirely on the daily silliness without any overarching problems to confront helps preserve the series' strong points. Most of the events chapters revolve around are standard fare as far as traditional Japanese activities featured in media go, so I could see the basic down-to-earth premise not clicking for some people. If you're into this, you're into this for the squad. Squad, and this squad is relieved of fan service. There is an early chapter where Yotsuba and company spend a day at the pool, and one later where they head to the ocean, though care is generally taken to have the focus remain on the typical innocent playfulness, rather than shifting towards inexplicable intimate nakedness. Jumbo also half-court launches Yotsuba into the pool, which absolutely makes up for any uncomfortable dialogue. Yotsuba's progressive maturation and development is to the point where going back to the earlier chapters can create moments where it feels the series hasn't quite figured out what it wanted to be yet. This progression is fitting for a story centered around a child exploring and learning about the world, as mentioned earlier how Yotsuba herself starts to feel like a more adult five-year-old, gradually becoming less rough both in terms of dialogue and visual design. Speaking of visuals, I've always felt bad half-skimming over the art and manga, and doing so hit me hard here. I wouldn't attempt to get it to stand shoulder to shoulder with the works of more legendary mangakas, but it's still gorgeous. I never know what the appropriate amount of time to look at a piece of artwork is, but I'm always left feeling like I moved on too quickly. There's some cute characterization that could be easily missed, like how Yotsuba climbs the stairs in her house on all fours like a child might. She also does this in the next door neighbor's home, which signifies to me how close she feels to them. Also, sometimes her pigtails flop down when she's tired, which makes me imagine her body has run out of energy to power her fun antennae. I think the weakest part of Yotsuba is the singular randomly placed Yonkoma chapter in the middle of volume 4. If you're not aware, Yonkoma is a style of comic which utilizes four panels to create a quick joke, and are typically disconnected ideas featuring recurring characters and setting rather than a straightforward narrative. Kiyohiko Azuma, the author of Yotsuba, is likely better known for the serialization of their other manga series Azumanga Daio, which is originally a Yonkoma. The way Yonkoma is presented is typically with the trademark four panels stacked vertically. You read from top to bottom and then have no reaction whatsoever because no Yonkoma has has ever resulted in anything, let alone a joke. I thank whatever manga gods realigned fate this way so that Yotsuba did not become Yonkoma because this chapter paper shredders practically everything I had come to enjoy. How could you treat this darling little rug rat with such recklessness? I spit on me! Other than this 0.96% of the manga, all of the stories are sweet, bite-sized candies of backyard expedition. For as vanilla as they might seem, one must remember that vanilla is a flavor with deep complexity that takes a true artisan to maximize its potential. I wrote that and thought it was good. <laughs> okay. Now, especially for as simple as the events in this series are, my goal in discussing any piece of art is to do so in a way that remains distant enough from any specifics to allow any audience to my discussion the ability to engage with the art themselves without already having every minor detail explained to them. Though if you'll allow me, there's one chapter that was so critical to my experience with Yotsuba that I'd feel incomplete not mentioning it. Chapter 18, Yotsuba to Obon, Yotsuba and Obon, starts as a continuation of the previous chapter where Yotsuba heads to a flower shop, charms the tallest man in the world who is also her friend who is also a florist's 
dad and receives a warehouse full of overstocked bouquets for 10 yen, roughly 11.06 yen accounting for inflation. Having his house blossoming with flowers, Yosuke transforms Yotsuba into Flower Cupid and gives her the life or death mission of handing out a basket of flowers. After some typical Yotsuba tomfoolery with a police officer and a street marketer, she heads to the park and meets with an older lady. Today is Obon, a traditional ancestor honoring Japanese holiday when it is believed the spirits of those who have passed away return home. Yotsuba is, naturally, overly blunt about this. An older man, related in some way to the lady, comes by, whom Yotsuba gives her last flower to. The lady whispers to Yotsuba that he's come back from heaven, to which the curious kiddo questions what kind of place heaven is like. The old man responds that there are lots of blooming flowers and delicious food. The slightest mention of food sets off Yotsuba's brain, so she says goodbye, wishes the old man safe travels back, and returns home. Yosuke, who Yotsuba consistently regards as making the most delicious meals, assures her that he's got something cooking. Yotsuba looks around and notices the great bouquet stemming from makeshift vases. Surrounded by blooming flowers and delicious food, she satisfiedly sighs, Tengoku na. I much prefer reading physical books as I already stare at screens for an unhealthy amount of time, yet spending money to treat myself does not come easy, especially for a large collection that would feel wrong to dispose of in any way that I might end up not enjoying, forever mutely shouting reminders of a mistaken purchase, a mistaken understanding of myself. This chapter was the strongest assurance I could have ever received that a genuine light smile and sharp exhale of joy would make themselves present every time my eyes chanced the series resting on my bookshelf. The first time I read this chapter, I almost thought that the older man was actually the spirit of someone who had passed away, returning to this world to allow an opportunity for joy to be spread. To have an ethereal magic in this world not represented by fantastical creatures or supernatural powers or once-in-a-lifetime events, but by humans, by connectable ideas, by joy flourishing in normality, that is the perfect encapsulation of what Yotsuba is to me. An angel of bliss taking the form of a five-year-old girl quite literally sharing the love overflowing from her house and herself with those around her. How could I not want to see that in my own life? After finishing this chapter, I immediately ordered a full set of the 15 volumes. And once they arrived, I again began to read from the beginning. What am I doing? I don't know. I don't read up here. <laughs> I ran out of space in my one bookshelf and had to place Yotsuba rather prominently on top of it. I've known this bookshelf for as long as I can remember. It's housed toys and children's books, though this is the first time it's ever been full. My next major purchase in life will likely be another bookshelf. The sun damage on the spines of my copies of Oyasumi Punpun are unfortunately striking. A bold coffee stain on a cover of Non Non Biori stares me down. Even Yotsuba was not safe. My copy of Volume 4 feels like someone dunked the top third underwater. Though for as clearly used as some of these books feel, I refuse to stack them vertically on top of one another or place them on the bottom shelf that's practically the floor. I try to take care of my physical belongings regardless of the state I receive them in. I'm curious what happened in the life of the original owner to spend time with them and later decide to sell them. Had they become disinterested in the series? Were they moving and no longer possessed the space these books filled? Did they emotionlessly scrounge them together from disconnected homes, aware of their value to a foreigner like myself? I can look at the eBay seller's profile and deduce the last of those three is probably closest to the truth. I feel a great conflict now from the perception that not a cent of my spending went directly to Kiyohiko, who I believe deserves my money more than a second or third hand online dealer does. I always want to support artists, though one look at the abundance of my music folder, and I'm reminded that I would be in significant debt if I attempted to give every artist my piece of financial support. I like to believe that somewhere down the line of passing hands and retailers and publishers, Kiyohiko got their cut of profits from the production of the book I now hold in my own hands. Moving forward, I'd like to be even more conscious of where my spending goes in relation to how much the original creator benefits from it, though it's always hard not to feel as if my money is disappearing into the void-like pockets of some faceless corporation. This is especially difficult in regards to a series that feels this authentically human, from which I can feel the soul creator's genuine passion for life inked into every sketch of a rambunctious tot and her pristine surroundings. I hadn't ventured past chapter 18 from when I ordered my physical set, and decided on a whim to reread the first two and a half volumes. This was unusual for me. 
Whether or not a product I want that's not vital to my being alive gets bookmarked into my things to buy folder comes down to purpose. How likely am I to actually use this item? How likely is it to remain untouched or worse, forgotten? I like to think I have a decent gauge on this, though in hindsight I often find my perspective clouded simply by desire for a new thing in my possession. I have a gorgeous refurbished region unlocked PlayStation 1 courtesy of Bitwizard with a selection of games I can confidently say I enjoyed when I initially played them. As it stands, weeks can pass where the dust cover is doing the most work. I own a record player and a selection of my favorite albums on vinyl. My strongest association with these is what all of their spines look like next to each other as they rest unplayed. And just next to these are four other manga series that I've finished but may very well never pick up again. Naturally, I'm not going to be rereading all 42 volumes of Dragon Ball every week, but I start to wonder if the physical book handling sensations were worth it for the one-time experience. This is to say nothing of my digital music library, from which I would have to listen to six albums every day for a year to complete once. For all of this artful entertainment I stockpile, my constant hunt for new things to have in my possession devalues repeat experiences. Why read a book series again? Why listen to an album again? Why do anything more than once when there is so much out there I've still yet to explore, so much out there that might affect me in some unexpectedly profound way? I've discussed this before, but it truly is a deciding factor of how I interact with this hobby of mine. I re-relay this to state how much Yotsuba had begun to affect me on some yet unknown level. Reaching chapters I had not read was nonetheless a relief for my motivation. Re-experiencing the exact same snippets of life is only enjoyable for so long. As I shared escapades with this fictitious family, I began to consider a serialization of a series into an anime. Kiyohiko stated early on in Yotsuba's publication that there would be difficulties adapting its specific style of story into an anime as an explanation for why the series has never made it out of the books. I'm mostly grateful for this decision. Had I been subjected to a voice actor bringing this adorable squirt to life via ear-annihilating high-pitched anime girl shrieks, Yotsuba would have made itself another casualty before the first episode concluded. But I started to realize it might have been more than that. Art tends to connect with me the deepest when it makes me consider a sense of human effort beyond whatever I'm directly interacting with, when it makes me consider the authentic love creators pour into their works. TV shows and movies and other large-scale productions represent remarkable feats of a large community of people being able to turn sprawling ideas into a tangible, complete piece of art. Long lists of credits are a great visual for this united effort, but I'm often left feeling disconnected. I feel it impossible to truly appreciate any pains of passion for this work that individual artists poured out of themselves. I'm on the Price is Right, assaulted with indistinct numbers shouted at me from a crowd of strangers, instead of having my parents assisting me with my monthly finances. Reading Yotsuba, I feel that individualistic love being shared. In no way do I believe that all large-scale productions are soulless purely by virtue of a lot of people having worked on them, but there's a unique feeling from putting my eyes right up against the page and discerning every hatch mark of shading and every individual line detailing the leaves of a tree in the back background foliage. Everything feels carefully, deliberately chosen. In this one panel, every detail cements the spirit of this world. Books and binders are haphazardly tossed in the shelf and on the floor, which feels in line with Yosuke's lackadaisical nature. A stack of floor books serves as a step stool for two short Yotsuba to reach the calendar. On the wall hang the exact drawings that Yotsuba was shown to create earlier. Even the soccer ball from the chapter we shan't mention peeks out in the corner. And this is but one dialogueless, near throwaway panel. Of course, an anime could easily replicate this layout and further personalize it with color and animation with minor movement nuances. I'm not trying to be some manga purist. This is just how this was able to connect with me personally, again surprising myself by taking my time reading through each page of each chapter of each book. Reading Yotsuba has helped me come to terms that certain experiences are just not for me, and it's not worth it to force them upon myself. There's a community for everything, and it's important to me that I find the ones most true to what I enjoy. 
Occasionally, I caught myself inadvertently speeding through sections, which I tried to consciously prevent as much as possible. It's rare to be chanced with an experience I enjoyed this much, and I wanted to not squander it. This world of simple pleasures is perhaps too alluring, and I often sympathize with Yotsuba's regrets over carelessly doing something she immediately knows she shouldn't have when I happen to pass through multiple chapters without fully realizing it. I don't remember anything of what I was doing alongside reading this series. I often look back at the end of the day and not have any recollection what I did that day or the day before, usually because most of my days feel exactly the same. Many a week has passed where the most remarkable happening was my weekly Saturday trip to the grocery store. I do remember reading Yotsuba though. Works being in Japanese tends to create a natural pace slower, though my motivation to push through any linguistic difficulties remained strong enough to continue thanks to how much I had fallen in love with every aspect of this series. Volumes often end with a larger activity that takes place over two chapters and is typically built up throughout the chapters leading up to it. These stuck in my mind as checkpoint reminders of sorts to allow myself to slow down, nevertheless inevitably finishing them in single sittings. Every book swap off my shelf when I had completed another volume was a stronger, physical reminder of the approaching end of Yotsuba, the final moment of joy there was left to experience with this community, the point where these people stopped existing. I received a new work project to start on when I had but one chapter remaining bring an unexplainable concoction of catharsis and anticipation and exciteful anxiety. One last forced breather, courtesy of some kind of fate. Seeing Yotsuba's genuine smile of love on the last page of the last chapter of the last volume, I was not sad, as I had expected to be. There was no pit in my stomach and no warm outburst of joy filling up my soul. There was a wall of memories. I remembered my parents' home in Colorado. I remembered when my neighbors at that Colorado home were nice to my family, and the time I lied to their dad that I was allergic to mustard so he wouldn't put it on the sandwich he made for me. I remembered learning the words stupid and dumb from that dad's kids. I remember playing Wii Sports and Rock Band on the Wii of the kids I had learned the words stupid and dumb from. I remember saving up over a hundred dollars of loose change I occasionally received from my parents so I could buy my own Wii from someone my mom knew. I remembered the leaf I found at the park that was so much bigger than my toddler hands that I had to bring it home. I remembered being deathly afraid of my house blowing away whenever tornado sirens started blaring during cartoon reruns. I remembered the serving tray my uncoordinated hands painted for a Father's Day gift. I remembered watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail with my dad and getting embarrassed when I heard something I knew was adult, even if I didn't know exactly what it was referring to. I remembered the post-baseball practice Dairy Queen Blizzard my grandma would always treat me to on the way back to her house during the summer. I remembered how ashamed I felt the one time my grandma drove past the Dairy Queen because I lost my temper during a baseball practice, yelling on my back in my tie-dye Crayola shirt because I had been tagged out. I remembered almost drowning in the community pool near my grandma's condo, which prompted my parents to enroll me in swimming lessons. I remember the drive home after adopting our family dog, trying to comfort her as she kept looking out the rear window in the direction of the home she had known up to that point. I remembered a spattering of the long-since-discarded Christmas presents I received. I remembered a spattering of the long-since-discarded Christmas presents I gave, which was more accurately my name written on the wrapping paper of a gift my parents had bought. I remembered a lively family Christmas party we had at our home one year, a Christmas story broadcasted on TBS, channel 247, playing on repeat the entire day. I remembered a lively family Thanksgiving party at my aunt and uncle's home in Minnesota. I remembered spitting into a trash bin as my dad furiously drove from my aunt and uncle's home in Minnesota to the hospital because I was having an allergic reaction to a baked good that included peanut butter and it hurt to swallow. I remembered the collection of stuffed turtles my parents had cultivated for me. I remembered watching 4th of July firework shows from the back porch of that Colorado home. I remember the neighbor on the cul-de-sac of that Colorado home who set off illegal fireworks at the end of our street one 4th of July. I remembered streams of various sports games flowing out of our TV and throughout our house every weekend. I remembered streams of hunting channel shows flowing out of our TV, though not as pervasively throughout the house as sports had. I remembered panicking the first time I ate ketchup because I thought it was too spicy. I remembered losing my first baby tooth while eating a firecracker popsicle standing on the steps in our garage. 
I remembered scouring the newspaper for the comics and puzzle sections every weekend. I remembered standing in front of my elementary school's announcement board for a picture on my first day of each year of school. I remembered the greatest spike of anxiety I had ever felt upon remembering that the science fair was the next day and having to work with my parents to get something put together in the late hours of the night. I remembered the allowance spreadsheet that marked my earnings for completing specific chores. I remembered kicking a bully in the shins as I lost my grip on the reins of my already poorly controlled emotions, walking with him as he hobbled over to tell a teacher, immediately regretting what I had done despite how much I hated this kid. I remembered seeing Mars in my driveway through the telescope that some unremembered day seemingly disappeared from existence. I remembered forcing myself to like Red Hots when my parents got them for me one time because I thought if you could handle them, you were more of an adult. I remember the basement full of Legos and how I always left buildings in their finished state, never taking them apart to construct other scenes not defined in an instruction book. I remembered my first trip to the ocean in San Diego when my family went to Legoland. I remembered my other grandma spending parts of summers in that basement with all of those Legos, equally careful to not step on any parts of the town I had laid out. I remembered walking home from the pool with that same grandma one summer day when we saw a plastic bag barely hanging onto tree branches, vigorously dancing in the wind. I remembered how often that grandma remembers that memory, always excited to re-remember together via text whenever she sees a loose plastic bag. I remembered crying on the last day of fourth grade because the few friends I had were in fifth grade and I thought I would never see them once they graduated to middle school. I did never see any of those friends again. I remembered my parents telling me I was going to the middle school where only two other kids in my grade were going. I remember the math teacher who was a massive Detroit Red Wings fan and who was also the best teacher I ever had and who also moved to Alaska. I remembered all of the obligatorily nerdy after-school clubs I was a part of. I remember the indestructible slide phone my parents got me and accidentally getting them an extra fee for going on the internet with it because I had looked up funny signs on Google Images. I remembered my wheelchair-bound, scholarly grandpa giving me his collection of science books that I never ended up reading. I remembered meals of white bread, chicken soup, and ginger ale for my almost yearly chest cold that one year turned into bronchitis. I remembered baking cookies with my mom and needing to taste test every ingredient. I remembered eventually stopping baking with my mom. I remembered crying the last day of 8th grade because my family was taking a trip to Europe and I had to leave early. I never got to say a last goodbye to most of the people I knew that were going to a different high school. I remembered the trip to Europe that burned me out of wanting to travel for good. I remembered the high school weight room where I took a strength and conditioning class purely to fulfill graduation credit requirements and subsequently became addicted to working out. I remember the Chinese takeout restaurant my family always ordered from and yet I never saw the inside of, my imagination turning it into this mystical place where cucumber rolls and sesame chicken willed itself into existence. I remembered stumbling across the album chart that would firmly set the course for my hobbies to follow, continuing through the current moment I remembered this memory. I remembered all of the YouTube channels I used to feverishly watch and the one I calculated roughly how long it would take for me to watch all of their videos. I eventually watched all of their videos. I remembered falling into online communities that gravely concerned my parents, yet which to me felt like the first true friends I had ever made. I remembered the clunky, free computer programs I grappled with in an attempt to show my love for these hobbies in a unique way to these uniquely online friends. I remember the slow descent into finding all that laid out there for me online. I remembered wondering when I was going to start liking girls. I remembered the unexpected conversation I had with my mom. I remembered the slightly more expected conversation my mom and I had with my dad. I remembered my mom giving me a bracelet and she had made for me the Christmas after I came out. I still wear that bracelet every day. I remember the day my school friends turned into the people I hung out with at school because I felt some social obligation to. I remember the Saturday morning I woke up, the vision in my right eye feeling far different than normal, and having my mom take me to the optometrist to run some tests and figure out what was wrong. I remember the Thursday I didn't go to school because my dad and I flew to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to run some incredibly advanced tests and figure out what was wrong. 
We never figured out what was wrong. I had to finish a paper from my English class as Thursday became Friday. I remembered all of the unusual alternative medicine practices we attempted, from the stuffy downtown building where I held copper rods to my forehead, to the quaint home office of the acupuncturist who looked exactly like my 8th grade English teacher. I remembered the electric pancake skillet that produced many a family dinner of grilled cheese sandwiches or pancakes. I remembered the one night I snuck my laptop into my bed because an artist I liked was doing physical copies of albums I had grown to love, and despite not owning any way to play those physical copies, I had to be there for when they dropped at one in the morning. I still have not purchased any of those physical copies. I remember the vinyl record shop I went to with my parents, browsing through their stock for two hours, repeatedly getting shocked to know that all of these albums I had known about through internet circles existed in the real world. I remembered buying the avalanches since I left you, despite not owning a record player, but feeling wrong passing up on what had at the time been the most personally influential album I had listened to. I remembered sneaking upstairs past whichever strangers to me, friends to my parents, were gathered in our kitchen so I could lay face down on my bed with Mogwai's Take Me Somewhere Nice, damming up any of the remaining tears I had left in my system after being ignored at a safe space gathering for LGBT youth and crying more defeatedly than I ever had on the lonely drive home. I remembered high school lunch periods where I walked with the people I hung out with at school because I felt some social obligation to across the street to the King Supers as they made snide remarks that veered on the edge of homophobia. I remembered trying to unobtrusively eat my lunch of a sandwich, triscuits, and carrots at 2pm during science class because I had started intermittently fasting, and 2pm was about an hour before I would work out in the school's weight room where I had discovered my addiction for exercising. I remembered my mom telling me that I didn't have to eat the Little Caesars pizza she bought on her way home if it felt too unhealthy for my diet. I remembered the Wii I had bought with over $100 of loose change from someone my mom knew, accumulating dust with every passing day I completely ignored it. I remember the day I uploaded You Reposted in Everyone's Neighborhood 2 in the corner of my school's cafeteria. For as inconsequential as that video and many other fun-had creative projects are to me now, I think I can pinpoint exactly where I was when I decided to click the upload button for each one of them. I remembered all of the photos of memories I had forgotten about, and the awareness of the invisible mass of unphotographed memories that vanished into nothingness. I remember the dating app I downloaded, because I had accepted there was no other way I would find anyone else like me. I remember the guy I started talking with that didn't result in an unmatch the same day. I remembered our second date where he came to my house and I showed him Portishead's Dummy because he shared some songs from Persona 5 that he liked, and I thought he'd enjoy Dummy. He enjoyed Dummy. I remembered buying the guitar at the music shop I had taken drum lessons at many years before so I could write and perform a song for him as a birthday present. I remembered sitting next to him and carefully articulating that I felt really good when we were together, and I thought that was what love was. I remembered having to ask him if he loved me too. I remembered how anxious I've always felt driving to a place I hadn't driven to before. I remember the first time I drove half an hour to hang out at his house. I remember the first time I drove an hour and a half to hang out at his college. I remember the smell of that tiny dorm room where two freshmen, much less hygienic than I was, were stuck together and allowed to unshoweredly scatter their belongings underneath their unmade beds. I remember the first night giving up attempting to sardine myself in a bed clearly only made for one person, and all of the albums I listened to that night, killing time until morning finally showed itself, and even then it was still too early. I remembered all of those times I used the waffle maker in the cafeteria of the school I did not attend. I remembered the swivel chairs in the common room that I never sat in because I was always afraid the only way of getting out of them was to fall out of them. I remembered all of the games I would have never wanted to play, and all of the movies I would have never wanted to watch, and all of the experiences I would have never seeked out, and doing these activities I would have never done myself because they were with the people and person I cared about most when no one else outside of my parents had cared about me. I remembered unceremoniously graduating from high school one December day in 2019, and not feeling as if anything major had changed. I remembered one February day in 2020, lurking by Snapchat stories from the people I hung out with at high school, mentioning they were getting a week off. I remembered the two weeks my dad's work told him to stay home, and how he almost lost his mind because there was nothing left in the house to clean, and he couldn't figure out how to occupy himself. 
I remember the day I went to the gym and found it strange how the parking lot was barren until I got close to the door and saw that it too had been closed indefinitely. I remembered how tight of a hug I gave a few months later the next time I drove an hour and a half to see the only non-family member left in my life. I remembered starting to walk up the staircase to his dorm room when I absentmindedly pulled up YouTube on my phone and saw that the hackers who had gotten a hold of my channel had started uploading videos. I remembered cold mornings I went skating before anyone would have ever considered waking up. I remembered colder nights we walked between homes later than I would have ever considered being awake. I remembered the sharpest pain I had ever felt in my ribs. From scarfing down a sub sandwich from the shop that branded itself around weed and immediately deciding to skate a mile to the other home we all hung out at. I remembered having conversations from across the room because I always felt much colder than everyone else and had to stand in front of his friend's heater to feel remotely comfortable. I remembered the heated conversation about what the best fruit was and other frivolous nothings because we just wanted to hear the other's voices. I remember the instance where everyone's conversation died down, and we all sat in silence for what would have been perceived as an awkwardly long amount of time, and yet how that was the best moment I ever had with them, because I had a moment to feel and know that this was all real. I remembered the phone call I received that I could never forget. I remembered the phone call I made that I had forgotten since the day after I made it. I remembered so much more than this, an unrecountable quantity of curious moments and backs of closets and silenced everythings, my entire existence all at once. I remember the conversation after getting a full-time job that paid enough to allow me to move a thousand miles away from my parents into my own apartment that ended the relationship with the only person not in my family I had ever said I love you to, at which point I stopped knowing what love meant. Love is a word I've uttered countless times in regards to my parents and experiences that I've forever shelved in. This has changed me somehow, I guess, reverence, but it has remained a transparent sheet of a word daintily covering every surface that theoretically brings me happiness. Since moving out and having full control over my life, I've been one of those people that says there aren't enough hours in the day. I would wake up at 5 in the morning so I could feel like I had a full day ahead of myself to have the ability and freedom to do whatever it was I wanted to do. My ever-extending lists of albums I wanted to listen to, video games I wanted to play, and movies and shows I wanted to watch were at constant odds with forcing myself 8 hours of sleep and needing to shelve away another chunk of time to my job so I could afford to keep living. By this point in my life, I had already discovered most of the albums that would have the greatest impact on me. How could you compete with an album that broadened my horizons of what music could be? How could you compete with an album that made me want to make music of my own? I'd like to believe that everyone is always capable of change and growth, and I know that major personal development can occur well into adulthood. However, the music-loving, self-discovering self I had been had mostly run out of self to discover once he reached the seemingly final coming-of-age milestone of having a stable job and moving out from his parents' home. Everything else that followed was an encore, purely for filling however many decades left I had to fill with the hobbies I knew I would never grow tired of. All of this art was fresh pickings for me, the most expansive strawberry orchard all to myself. I could fully commit myself to doing only the things I wanted to do, and so I did. Cooped up in my new apartment, I for the first time went on an expedition of life purely for myself. To be able to experience whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, was what I had been fantasizing about probably my entire life. Now, despite how adventurous I might be making my character sound, this purely meant sitting at my desk in the corner of my tiny living space with whatever new piece of media next on my list blaring from two bright monitors. But I was happy. I listened to a lot of music I liked. I played a lot of video games I liked. I made a lot of videos I wanted to make. I had fun with whatever I was doing. And so I kept doing it. A year passed, as it does, and I bought a townhome, still content with all of my personal, solitary interests. I made an album, and life had felt different than it had since before I could remember. 
I won't rediscuss this portion of my life in as much detail as I have previously, but in short, I stopped taking interest in the hobbies I had carried with me for the past few years, yet was still forcing myself to engage with them in an attempt to rekindle what had become a pile of ash. I thought if I just kept doing the things I knew I loved, I would start to feel good again. And so I blazed through creative projects like they were finger foods at a buffet, swallowing down experiences only to be thinking about which one I was going to be shoving in my mouth next, never tasting any of them. My gluttonous, junky self was never satisfied. Sitting at my desk in the middle of my living space with whatever new piece of media next on my list blaring from two bright monitors, I had forgotten what love meant. Incapable of distancing myself from the flow of life I had buried myself into, I began thinking that there were too many hours in the day. I wished days were half as long so I could wake up, go to the gym, eat, and sleep, without all of this extra time to be inescapably confronted by the loss of myself. When I had the smallest sliver of motivation to find more art to eventually engage with, I tried branching off from what I had liked previously. There was a My Anime List interest stat called The Spectrum of Slice of Life, which connected to a few other series I had known about. With genuinely nothing else to use up my time with, I decided I'd check out the first series on that list. I gave Yotsuba a chance because the Japanese was simple enough to not feel like a challenge to understand, let alone enjoy, and it was silly. Comedies are easy to resonate with me, and the overall world was simple to grasp. Yotsuba was just having fun in fun ways, resulting in interesting reactions from everyone around her. I read the first chapter. I read the second chapter. I bookmarked it before the third chapter, expecting to wake up the next day and decidedly give up on it, like what had happened with most every creative project the past while. And something strange happened. I had feelings of not wanting to continue reading, but because I wanted to savor it, I cautiously read more, and Yotsuba began acting as my mental pick-me-up whenever I struggled appreciating life like this wild animal of a girl could. For so long, I had begged experiences to get themselves over with, wishing games could be shorter so I could say I beat them and move on to something else as soon as possible, and often giving up early on because of the long journey I would have to trudge through. But with Yotsuba, there was this crushing thought of, I don't want this to end. I was disappointed whenever it felt like an activity was being skipped over, like when Yosuke mentions to Yotsuba they're going to go shopping, but you don't get to see the adventures they had while shopping. I wanted to be with these characters as long as possible, to the point where I had wished to see them carry out even the most menial, uninteresting tasks. Once I received the full physical collection, my savoring of every bite turned back into buffet-style consumption. I couldn't help myself from wanting to read a volume or two in a single sitting. My mind had been consumed by this feral preschooler. Initially, I was upset and sad at how single-mindedly I ripped through every precious story, but I realized that's, in a sense, what I want. Getting engrossed in just one thing without feeling overwhelmed or disinterested, an experience so great that I never want to leave. And yet I had a greater realization. Every joyous moment in this series is the result of multiple people coming together and sharing an experience. Yotsuba to, Yotsuba and is not about an individual, but a community, and one engaged in incredibly simple pleasures. Sleep, food, always being there for each other. They laugh, they make mistakes and forgive, they do the most unembellished nothings, and enjoy every moment of it. On my best days, I feel myself bursting with this enjoyment for all there is, though it often spoils as it doesn't get expressed to anyone and withers as garbage in the bottom of my heart. I've become a master at breaking ties with people under the excuse of, I enjoy spending time alone. Friends from school, friends from online communities, my sole romantic relationship, all of whom I'd still likely be together with if I hadn't convinced myself that I feel love the strongest when I'm on my own. Yotsuba has taught me love again. Yotsuba has taught me that I only love the experiences I love when I have others I can share that love with. I've lived but one life and possess a limited supply of memories before they become so vague that they might not be real. Therefore, I must recognize the priceless value in the sharing of memories and experiences 
completing an existence that would otherwise forever have holes in its foundation. I believe that making videos circulating around the experiences I cherished, whether directly in the case of video essays like this, or more vaguely through the utilization of samples of songs I liked and music I produced, was enough to satisfy that desire of community. YouTube is a phenomenal platform for expressing life's experiences and uncovering the untold stories insistent on spreading their wings, though there will unavoidably be a disconnect between the creator who refines their one-sided conversation thousands of times through video editing software and the viewer who, years later, stumbles upon this abandoned mall of ideas presented to no one in particular. The version of myself recording this video will be dead as soon as I click stop recording. There is no substitute for authentic human interaction. I think I will forever be struggling to compartmentalize the teachings of Yotsuba and all of the life I've lived into an output of my own. However, if I die without ever having strung together the perfect necklace of words and sounds and images and actions, I'll be ultimately disappointed as an artist, but also resolved, knowing that it never would have mattered anyway if even a single stone had been slightly too cloudy, and that this is likely a futile endeavor, for the only way one can truly understand those teachings is to be taught wordlessly through some slice of time with some ragtag assortment of other pupils that will then forever be unignorably unforgettably massive in the personal universe of this one self. All of this is to say, what good is love if you don't have anyone to share it with? The third revelation was a slow burner and sprouted itself from the soil of my two previous ones. While reading Yotsuba, I was fully focused on the happenings of the story, experiencing events directly as Kiyohiko intended. I put subconscious effort towards keeping the characters and plot organized, and a more conscious effort on understanding the language. Only once I stopped reading was the series able to affect me on a level deeper than cute mischief. This made me realize that the meaningful changes and the love that's gained from experiences can only happen once the experience has concluded. Events need to float around in my mind for a bit before I have time to process what they truly mean to me. Like how muscles grow stronger during the rest period following a workout, this separational gap needs to happen for personal growth to occur. Previously, I had been trying to construct a Rome's worth of emotional connection in 15 minutes, but Yotsuba has taught me that I can't expect major changes to happen in the moment. The most important moments when I realized how Yotsuba approaches life, or that every fun-filled event is the result of a community, happened when I wasn't occupying myself with some stream of media or other task for my brain to be occupied with. The intervals of quietness between chapters were the greatest times I had with Yotsuba. I want to continue that. I want to allow myself to savor life without this furious demand for completion or newness. I want to live every moment without expectation and love whatever happens. And I want to share that love, human to human, so it becomes real. I think I have been given conscious awareness of my being on this earth to uncover hidden loves and share my own. Sometimes I will struggle through droughts of enjoyment, and that's natural. I have a passion for music and other forms of art because they are a representation of humanity and all of its love. Albums and books and video games are products of a person or a community's authentic craftsmanship of joy, and I want to help share that joy with anyone and everyone I can. As with all creative projects, this video encountered roadblocks on the way to its completion. I developed a scratchy throat near the end of recording and start of editing. I still retained a feverish desire to work on this video, as I didn't have anything else to do with my time. Confronted against the lack of interest in wanting to do anything that had arisen from my throat problems, I again fell into the trap of needing to brush everything aside to feel done. 
I'd begun to hate the voiceover that I'd previously been okay with, and doubted the script as a whole. And that's not to mention the part of recording whose audio got messed up. To record the sections in my bedroom and spare room, I had to mad scientist myself a setup, unplugging equipment from where it always rests and hauling it upstairs. In this process, settings in my recording software got changed, and it ended up recording the audio from my microphone and the far worse audio from my camera on top of one another. I was not in the mood to re-mad scientist my temporary recording setup, though I still wanted to use the footage for artistic reasons, so I tried fixing as best as I could the scene in the spare room and overdubbing the scene in the bedroom that was beyond fixing. Yes, that is lazy. Yes, that is bad. Yes, I should have just grown a pair and recorded everything again, but my scratchy throat self was on the verge of banishing this project with an empty recycle bin jurisdiction. I gave it some time, and my perspective shifted yet again. I thought about the times Kiyohiko must have struggled with drawing a certain element, and how important it was to them at that moment 15, 20 years ago. I thought about how many hours of frustration this artist grappled with that were completely lost on me, the reader, as I happily passed by any imperfect representations of creative vision because I was in love with this world. I'm sure there were panels that contained perspective issues or plot inconsistencies or strange dialogue, and for as much as those blemishes might have yelled at Kiyohiko that this was a creative project better left scrapped, I never noticed them. And I am forever grateful any imperceptible faults did not result in this series getting lost in the recycle bin. I'm projecting, of course, but this thought experiment helped me better come to terms with my own yelling blemishes. What does it matter if a piece of art is good or exactly as I want it to be if it drowns in artistic perfection? What does this love matter for if it remains unexpressed? No one is going to hate me forever, or arrest me, or kick me in the shins because a sliver of my art wasn't exactly as I envisioned it in my mind. I am not making decisions that will save the lives of millions. I am making a video that maybe 50 people will be listening to by this point. Who cares? <laughs> art is never finished, only abandoned. But I don't see it as abandonment. I see it as a moment of humanity. By releasing a work of art, I am accepting my human limits of what I'm able to accomplish, and I'm letting my love spill over. I am declaring this love is so strong that I cannot let it remain caged for another minute. What's more authentically, passionately human than that? For as much as I've wanted to feel done, Yotsuba has reminded me that I'm only creating inevitable frustration by doing so. Yotsuba is known for being an easy read for beginners learning Japanese, but I was still able to learn many new words I had never encountered before. Growth is a forever process, and there is always something to gain from every experience if you give it time. But the most immediate way in which Yotsuba affected me comes at the very end of Volume 12. It's early morning at the campsite where Yotsuba and her typical crew stay the day before. Yotsuba is the first to wake up, with everyone else slowly following. Mug of cocoa in hand, Yotsuba gazes out upon the open horizon and asks, Kyo wa nani shite asobu? What are we going to do today? Simple purity. Every day is a wondrous gift to have fun with. There is a now, there is a today, there is a present to be lived in and life to be loved, and love is everything and everything only exists in the present. Tomorrow or any idea of finality is not even a thought because there being a today is reason enough to love everything. And Yotsuba can't love by herself. She asks an inspecific someone and uses the word asobu, literally, to play. This is pure coincidence of how Japanese happens to be translated into English, yet it's an unintentional double entendre that feels deliberate. Life is a constant opportunity to have fun with those around you, sharing your loves and bettering everyone you can. Today is always the most fun day. I see Yotsuba's smile, and I remember my entire life. I remember being Yotsuba's age. I remember everyone I've ever loved. I feel sad knowing how much love I've pushed aside and how much love I have bottled up. 
I want to be forever sharing love and doing all I can to make all of this everything pristinely beautiful with the simple joys I often forget myself. For as committed in ink to paper as these unchangeable, unextendable slices of life finitely present themselves, I know they will always be there for me to remember and re-remember. All of this art that I looked at for less than what felt like an appropriate amount of time will always be there for me to absorb every hatch mark of shading and every individual line detailing the leaves of a tree in the background foliage. Yet I cannot shake the hands of every years ago pencil marking. I cannot forever keep in my mind the wondrous intricacies of every snapshot of life. These stories will fade from me, as will my stories fade from whatever greater work I happen to exist as a part of. I will never remember long enough to know what this greater work is about. All I can hope is to impart my stories on someone who can remember, if only just longer enough than me to better their understanding of their own piece in this universal tapestry. As long as I am breathing, I always have time to love. I always have time to share my love. I am forever sorry to all of those that I did not love as well as I could have. I am forever sorry to those once friends I gave up on. I am forever sorry to those I unknowingly ignored because I was too busy trying to find love all on my own. I have frustrated myself in trying to mold my final thoughts into magnificent, swirling sentences of 50-cent words to attempt to impart some grand sense of emotion that affects anyone that hears it, but Yotsuba created that personal impact with only mundane, unextraordinary stories at its disposal. When I see this green-haired girl for whom every day is a fresh chance to inspire joy, I am inspired myself to seek out and share those simple pleasures in my own real life to take life one blissful moment at a time, to fully live in all of those individual moments. Yotsuba isn't special because life doesn't have to be special. All that matters is you get to share experiences with those you love. Aitsu wa nan demo tanoshimeru kara na. Yotsuba wa muteki da. That kid can make fun out of anything, huh? Yotsuba is invincible. bit of an epilogue as it's been like two months since I finished this video and not much has really changed. I got into a really destructive headspace yesterday over a lot of the stuff related to what's in this video. I think what this video comes down to is I burn myself out of hobbies really easily and I'm just kind of (laughs) lonely. So if anyone out there is like open to getting a dm from me just being like hey you want to listen to an album together and they can like mostly on the spot be like sure and we can hang out over discord and do that right or they're like hey i'm gonna play this old japanese game you want to watch and help translate like i need a buddy like that i need an art appreciating amigo if anyone out there is willing to be that person, like, my DMs are open. 